Thanks to everyone for tuning in to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel and our weekly Bible study. We pray that all of your July 4 celebrations were safe, uh, orderly, and uh, enjoyable. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us to focus on the main thing of this lesson, which is the plain thing when, it, when we're looking at life according to your wisdom and not the wisdom of man. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our focus uh, verse uh, again this week is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, which reads, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish uh, foolishness, but unto us who are saved it is the power of God. Now, the Living Bible version of that same verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, reads this way, says, I know very well how foolish it sounds to those who are lost when they hear that Jesus Christ died to save them. But we who are saved recognize this message as the very power of God. We spent several months studying from Mark chapter 7, verse 14 through 23, and the main question was, according to the Bible, what defiles us? That question not only should be answered by non-believers, but especially by believers. Now, as stated in other lessons, uh, we are studying using the method of systematic theology, which is any study that answers the question, what does the whole Bible teach us today about any given topic? And we're, we're, we're continuing our study about uh, what defiles us, and, and now we're transitioning over to uh, some good things that we need to focus on. And, and, and on the way to those things, we're looking at uh, how people consider the gospel, the good news, or uh, uh, and, and so we're going to spend a little time here and then go to some good things. So how did the Corinthians uh, create a four-way division? That's where we finished up last week. That some were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm following Cephas, which was Peter. Some were saying, I'm following Jesus. So they ended up with a four-way uh, division there. Uh, now, why were there quarrels? or contentions among them? And, and, and perhaps if we can answer that question concerning Corinth, we can surmise the answer for the church today because the same thing is going on far too often. Now, we finished up, I asked you to ponder the question last week uh, uh, from the statement, they were looking at the gospel from a philo philosophical point of view. Could that be the problem today? Corinth was a city filled with teachers and philosophers, all of whom wanted to share their wisdom. We're still living in cities filled with many teachers and philosophers, and all of them want to share their wisdom. Another answer is that human nature enjoys following human leaders. Saul, for instance, King Saul in the Old Testament became king of Israel because they wanted a human leader over God being their king. They wanted a king like the other nations that were not chosen by God. So let's get specific. We are talking about the church, the born-again believers in Jesus Christ. Now Exodus chapter 20, and I'm using the message version a few times this week uh, for simplicity. Exodus chapter 20 verse 2 says, I am God, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the life of slavery. Now we as believers, the church should be uh, sure of the fact that only the Lord has brought us out of the bondage of sin that held us captive from our birth up until the moment that we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We are 
specifically referring to those that, as I just mentioned, that Jesus has delivered out of the penalty of sin by uh, his atoning death on Calvary, which was termed justification. He set us in a right standing with God. And, and the people that we're being delivered now in this time of our lives, at, we've already accepted Jesus. We've been justified uh, before God. Now we're being delivered from the power of sin. It's an ongoing process. If you say that you have no sins, that you haven't sinned today even, you're deceiving yourself. Satan has a good hold on you. You need to be, be careful. Just, just, just look at life from a biblical view, the way God says it. And God says, if you say you have no sin, the truth is not in you. So we are being delivered from the power of sin. Uh, the Lord is breaking those bonds that are holding us. Now, that's called sanctification, uh, justification, sanctification, and then the last one is glorification. When Jesus returns and does away with sin completely in this world and everything, then we will be glorified with him and we will be free of the presence of sin. That's why it's important to not only accept Jesus as your Savior, but to accept him as your Lord also. Now, uh, Isaiah chapter 45, verse uh, 21 through 24, in the message version, uh, says, So tell me what you think. This is God talking to his people through Isaiah. So tell me what you think. Look at the evidence. And, and, and the, most of the book of Isaiah is presented much like a trial or courtroom scene. It says, look at the evidence. And then put your heads together as, as a jury, 12 uh, of your peers. Put your head together and make your case. Who told you, and a long time ago, what was going to happen? In other words, God said, I'm the one that told you you're going to end up where you are. I told you a long time ago. Who made sense of things for you? Wasn't I the one? God? It had to be me. I'm the only God that there is. The only God who does things right and knows how to help. Woo, that's a strong statement. God is saying, I'm, and he's still that way. Not only in Isaiah's time, He's still the only God who does things right, no matter how we might feel about it, no matter how we might not understand it or agree with how, what he did or didn't do. He's the only God that does things right and knows how to help. Verse 22 says, so turn to me and be helped or be saved. Everyone, Whoever and wherever you are, I'm the God, the only God there is, the only one, the one and only God. I promise in my own name and every word out of my mouth does what it says. I never take back what I say. Everyone is going to end up kneeling before me. Everyone is going to end up saying to me, yes, salvation and strength are in God. All who have raged against him will be brought before him, disgraced by their unbelief. Philippians, that's the Old Testament. Let's go to the New Testament. Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 10, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version just uh, temporarily, uh, says, So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 3, uh, verse 29, the message version. And, and, and to kind of set the stage for the story while you're finding that verse. Uh, 
it, it says, uh, uh, it's talking about uh, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar that had the three uh, Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thrown into the fiery furnace because they would not kneel to him. Uh, he got up early this morning, that morning, because he couldn't sleep. And he went to the uh, uh, furnace and he asked the guys that he had assigned to throw them in, not the ones that actually threw them in because they were burnt up as they threw the three Hebrew young men in. But he asked the one that he had assigned, gave the order to. Did not I tell you to throw three in? They said, yes, O king. He said, well, then why do I see four? And the fourth one looks like a son of God. So the verse says, this is Daniel chapter 3, verse 29. The message version says, therefore, I issued this decree. This is the king's, uh, this action is the king result of uh, seeing that there was somebody stronger and mightier than himself. It says, therefore, I issued this decree. Anyone, anywhere, of any race, color, or creed who says anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be ripped to pieces, limb from limb, and their houses torn down. There has never been a God who can pull off a rescue like this. That's somebody that's not a believer, not one of the chosen people of Israel. One that had led the charge, uh, gave the order to, to go and annihilate and just, just and then bring back the best of them concerning the Israelites. The world today would be a much better place if mankind would choose Jesus as king. Isaiah was one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, but he only saw the Lord's throne when King Uzziah died and left his throne empty. Isaiah declared in chapter 6, verse 1, he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. It's dangerous to see any uh, man, no matter what their position or title might be, it's dangerous to see them above the Lord. We tend to identify more with spiritual leaders who help us uh, and whose ministry we understand and enjoy. They don't really have to help us don't really have to uh, be such that we understand. Too often it's just we in, enjoy. You know, I ask some people, they say, I really enjoyed your sermon. Well, what did I preach about? Uh, 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 uh. People like to enjoy just hearing wisdom. Uh, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, the English Standard Version says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God. And this is why people don't understand, and their determination is that they enjoyed it. He says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. Instead of emphasizing the message of the word, the Corinthians and too often believers today emphasize the messenger. I, I, I just need to say that again. Instead of emphasizing the message of the word, the Corinthians and the church of the day too often emphasize the messenger instead of the word. They got their eyes off of the Lord and on to the Lord's servant. And this led to competition. Competition leads to opposition, contention, conflict, feuding, and fighting. 
Paul will point out in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that there can be no competition among true servants of God. Mm. That's deep. It is sinful for church members to compare pastors or for believers to follow human leaders as disciples of men and not disciples of Jesus Christ. The, the personality cults in the church today are in direct disobedience to the word of God. That's something else. I need to say that again. The personality cults in the church today are in direct disobedience to the word of God. And, and, and when, a, when, a, when a congregation or a church denomination is uh, personality driven, then when that personality, when that popular leader is gone or decides to go to something big, bigger and better, then those that are left feel lost. Only Jesus Christ should have the place of preeminence. Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 18, English Standard Version says, and he said, uh, uh, this is what he said, and he is the head of the body. Jesus Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent above everything, above everybody. Paul uses several key words in this section to emphasize the unity of saints in Christ. First of all, he calls his readers brethren, reminding them that they belong to one family. The phrase perfectly joined together or perfectly fit together in the, in the uh, uh, King James Version is a medical term that describes the unity of the human body knit together. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 16 says, uh, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Woo! In a, in, a, in, a, in a term that's used in the work industry today when you're looking for a job, uh, 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 companies are looking for individuals to hire that are a good fit. But there's nobody that ought to fit together like the members of the body of Christ. He said, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So they had a loving union as members of one body. They were also identified by the name of Jesus Christ. This probably refers to uh, their baptism. We, 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 do, we don't know who the people were who belonged to the house of Chloe that we mentioned last week that, that, that uh, uh, gave Paul the information about the division, the divisiveness in uh, the church in Corinth. But we have to commend them for their courage and their devotion. They did not try to hide the problem. We're living in a world where people are are hiding the problem of divisiveness when we should be speaking up. They were troubled by them. They went to the right person with their problem, with their report. They, they were not afraid to be mentioned by Paul. Most of the time, somebody uh, will, that will stand up, now don't, tell, don't, don't tell nobody I told you. Don't mention my name. I don't want to be a part of it. You know, but they were not afraid for Paul to mention their name. He says, I was told that there is division among you, Corinthians, by those that are members of Chloe's house. 
this was not the kind of cloak and dagger affair that we often in the church activ church's activities that usually make the problem worse and not better by, by, by not following the example of those of Chloe's house. We usually make the problem worse and not better. Paul was the minister who founded the church. So most of the problems would have been converted, uh, most of the problem members would have been converted through his ministry. Apollos followed Paul in Acts 18 chapter verse 24 through 28 and had an effective ministry. We have no record of Peter or Cephas ever visiting Corinth unless it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 5. You can check that out for yourself. Each of these men had different personalities and different approaches to the ministry of God's word, but yet they were one. Check out 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 through 8, and chapter 4, verse 6. They were one. I'll end tonight's study with two thoughts. What's the most important thing to believe or for us to be, be settled on? The most important thing is our belief and our character should be one. What we believe and our character, the way we live, should be one. This should be the thing that defines us. What we believe and how we live or our conduct in life should define us. The way we love the brethren. Jesus said, by this all men shall know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We should believe that Jesus Christ died on Calvary to atone for our sins. Jesus and no one else. Our faith should be steadfast enough to direct our character based upon the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and him only. Christ is the sole means of our salvation. Our hope is truly built on nothing less than Jesus. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let me close. Father God, we ask that you will continue to increase our faith and help our unbelief for the purpose of growing us in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Well, that's it for this week. Uh, I pray that you will be, be blessed by it, that your understanding of God, your knowledge of God will be increased. I pray that more will happen from this Bible study than you enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us again. We'll see you next week if the Lord's will. Well, we won't see you, but in my mind's eye. Take care. Love you. God loves you too. Bye-bye.